The president's calling for, as previous administrations have, the withdrawal of troops, final withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. We went in for two reasons, and that is to uh, defeat al-Qaeda and to kill Osama bin Laden. Uh, you'll never really totally get rid of al-Qaeda. They're like ISIS or any other terror group. There are cells around the world. But we basically accomplished both of those missions, Jay. Meanwhile, we've had over 4,500 troops killed, over 20,000 wounded. But the objective has been achieved. It is time to come home. A majority of senators, majority of congressmen uh, agree with pulling troops out. That's been true for some time. I will tell you this, though, the willingness of those who are willing to say it, Jay, it depends on the president that's announcing it. You heard a lot of senators who were silent when President Trump began this process, who are now applauding this decision. That, that That's probably political. But there are several who have been consistently in favor of this. I think of uh, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Mitt Romney, and others. Our friend Lindsey Graham, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. His concern about total withdrawal, Wes, is letting al-Qaeda and ISIS come back in those regions. When you look at our intelligence assets on the ground, you look at our ability uh, with overflight and satellite imagery to see what's going on. You look at the capabilities of special operations forces, which can be sent in and sent out very quickly, and airstrikes. Uh, it's, it's a different situation. Uh, we have the capability to monitor Afghanistan and to go in and make strategic attacks to, to defeat possible terrorist cells and camps in a way that we did not 20 years ago. Even if we leave, we can still re-engage without massing troops. Not only that, we can not only re-engage, we can actually defeat terrorist cells in pockets there without even having troops on the ground other than special operations forces that are deployed from time to time. The economic dollars that we're spending over there and where they end up, Wes, you never really know. I was looking at a report this morning from the Pentagon. It's their uh, cost of war report, which came out in September. We have spent over $815 billion in Afghanistan. A lot of that we cannot even account for. We don't know what some of their government leaders did with some of that $815 billion, but that's what the war has cost us. However, this same report said if you add in the disabled veterans and others that continue to get paid, continue to have medical treatment, the war over there has cost us $2 trillion. It has cost us over 4,500 American troops' lives. We have got to make sure we do a better job of making sure that the dollars allocated are flowing to the mission. Uh, that is uh, the safety of America. For far too long, as Wes illustrated, we have sent those dollars to advanced missions that are expired or, quite frankly, that serve the interest of other superpowers around the world. We've got to focus that in and make sure that they're spent on the safety of America. Jay, i got to tell you, while I think maybe the move to leave Afghanistan is the right one, I am not confident that that second mission, properly allocating our foreign policy dollars, I don't think that's being accomplished right now. Then you have at the same time, this is all happening at the same time, Russia has amassed troops on the Ukrainian border. China is doing maneuvers over Taiwan. China and Russia also engage directly with Iran. Economically, militarily, they're engaged. There is a perception with China, Russia, and Iran that the United States is a declining power, that we are weak, a Chinese official just this week, Jay, said that the weakness of America is our two-party system, that if they had a one-party system like we do, you could get more things done. You need a foreign policy of vigilance. You need a foreign policy of strength. And I think each of these regions, Jay, is exercising wide latitude because they think they can take it in this moment. Ukraine says that Russia has moved 80,000 troops to the border uh, and that there's no discussion, there's no communications going on between Mm -hmm. Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, and Putin. For, for several years now, Ukraine has petitioned they want to become part of NATO. They're not right now. We, we try to arm them and train them, but they're not technically part of NATO because if they're part of NATO, if one country gets attacked, as is if all of them are getting attacked, yep. I think Russia realizes that at some point, NATO, NATO may, may op be open to those overtures, they need to go ahead and invade and take it over before it becomes a part of NATO, and I think that's part of their calculus. I look at China, I look at Russia, I see Iran, okay? Yes. That's yes. how I view it. I see Russia, China, Iran as the kind of the commonality. Yes, they're But alive. they're also, Russia and China are looking at adjacent property, so to speak. Right. So on what is China doing with regard to Taiwan, other than their statements. Invading their airspace. They've done that this week. Uh, over 20 uh, combat aircraft from, from mainland China have invaded Taiwan. They actually circled the island. 
And uh, they have made it very, very clear. They they see Taiwan as a part of Chinese territory. They have made it very clear that is it is their intention to reunite Taiwan with mainland China, even if that is by force. And they have actually stated that. That's what happens when the world superpower gives an opening. I mean, when you have a strategy of appeasement, other world powers who actually would like to dominate the globe are going to flex their muscles. Here's the thing about Russia, China and Iran. They perceive weakness and weakness, Jay, always invites aggression. This is going to be a test of foreign policy, of defense for the administration. I mean, this is a big, big test.